And welcome to Hope and Passion Ministries. We're learning how to pray and pray more deeply. I'm glad that you're here. This is called Praying Past Platitudes, going deeper in prayer. Go to the website, hit the Contact Us button, and let us know that you'd like the scripture reference sheet. In that way, you don't feel like you have to be writing down every scripture reference as we go, but you will have it for later on to look up these verses again. I'm going to dig right into this in just a minute. I certainly want to pray first before our prayer session. And we're going to pray again with your heart combined with mine toward the Lord Almighty, asking him to do a miracle for each and every one of us in our prayer lives. God, we come in the name of Jesus. We know there's no other name. There's no other way. I thank you, Father, that you have provided a single way through your son, Jesus Christ, for us to have relationship with you, for us to talk to you. And that even though he is the only way, that way is open to anyone who would be willing to trust in him as savior. We come in his name and we ask your spirit to move mightily over the internet, over this live stream, uh, the, the future recording of this, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name that you would move and that you would stir people's hearts because we're living in a time of uh, lifeless Christianity. I, I mean, it's not even Christianity when it's lifeless, God, but this religiousness that does not qualify as Christianity. We're living in a time where people are just dry toward you. And we need an outpouring of your spirit. We need a prayer life that matters. And I'm asking you to do that for us through this message in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Here we go. I'm actually going to start, before I go to the main scripture, I'm going to start with a quote of Oswald Chambers. Now, I just want you to know that Oswald Chambers is pretty deep. And he hits hard. Some of his quotes are hard to digest, but, you know, he has that famous devotional, my utmost for his highest. Challenging but true, and this is a perfect quote to start out our session this evening. Oswald Chambers says, are you seeking great things for yourself instead of seeking to be a great person? God wants you to be in a much closer relationship with himself than simply receiving his gifts. He wants you to get to know him. Now think about that. Are you seeking the gifts of God rather than seeking for God to know you and for you to know him? Are you seeking what he can give you rather than how he can work in you and change you? Even some large thing we want is only incidental. It comes and it goes. But God never gives us anything incidental. There is nothing easier than getting into the right relationship with God unless it is not God you seek, but only what he can give you. Let's reread that. There's nothing easier than getting into the right relationship with God unless it's not God you seek, but only what he can give you. So many times our prayer is full of things that we want from God rather than us getting to know God. <clears throat> and that's important. I believe I said this before. I think it was A.W. Tozier who had a quote uh, similar to this, and I'm paraphrasing. Every man, woman, teenager, child has as much of God as he or she wants. You say, well, I'm not as close to God as I want to be. That's because you really don't want to be. You really have an image of what you think prayer life should lead to or what you think relationship with God is, but that's not really what you want. You want what you want rather than God. Let us be convicted by that. If you have only come as far as asking God for things, you've never come to the point of understanding the least bit of what surrender really means you have become a christian based on your own 
terms. And, and I know this has to be in some other countries. It's certainly here in America. We have mega churches and small churches just filled with people who are, who are Christians on their own terms, which is really not Christian at all. It is about seeking and knowing God, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and not about what we can get from him. So number one, if your prayer life it seems mundane, if it seems routine, if, if you're not really, really getting anywhere, we've got to consider what we are praying for. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Have you said, oh Lord, completely fill me with your Holy Spirit? If God does not, it is because you are not totally surrendered to him. There's something you still refuse to do. Are you prepared to ask yourself what it is you want from God and why you want it? Wow. What are we really seeking in prayer? Because the honest answer should come back. I am seeking God. Whatever he wants to show me, however he wants to change me, whatever he wants to take from me, I am seeking God. I want to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I want to be effective for his kingdom, not for my own wants and desires. God always ignores your present level of completeness in favor of your ultimate future completeness. Look at that. He's not concerned about making you blessed and happy right now, but he's continually working out his ultimate perfection for you. Romans 8, 28, everybody loves the quote, everything works together for the good for those who love God, who've been called according to his purpose. But they forget the context, the very next verse, those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that Jesus Christ might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Our destiny is to be conformed to the image of Christ. So you say, well, I'm praying. I'm praying for God to answer. I'm praying for God to give me this, for God to heal me of this, for God to fix this situation, for God to bless me in this way. And that's not what I'm getting. Well, maybe, number one, you're, you're praying with wrong motive. And number two, God is using those things to conform you to the image of Christ, but that's not what you're looking for, right? So we're going to talk about this. Uh, I'm going to give you a main text, which is Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And uh, I'm using the New International Version here. I don't often do that. The reason that I am is I myself memorized this passage years and years ago, did a big study on this personally, and I'm just familiar with it in that version. I want to share that version with you. This is going to be our key text for the evening. I'm going to appeal to other scriptures, but I want you to remember this as a model of the depth of prayer from the Apostle Paul. So this passage starts out in Ephesians 3.14. The Apostle Paul says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father. So of course, when we see that phrase, for this reason, we, we know we have to back up and say, okay, what is the reason that Paul is praying? What's the reason that he's kneeling before the Father? So it's important to understand context. Even though Ephesians 3.14-21 to 21 is our main text, we're going to back it up a few verses to find out what is the reason initially that Paul is even praying this prayer. Let's go back to verse 10 and watch this. The Apostle Paul wrote down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God's intent, now watch this, this is incredible. God's intent was that now, right now, in the times in which he was living and the times in which we live, that right now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that's a mouthful, but what the Bible is saying here is that God wants to make known his manifold wisdom. I mean, 
We can't even search the depths of God's wisdom. And yet God wants to show off or make his wisdom be known to who? The rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Now, if we cooperate this with scriptures such as Ephesians 6, 12, we know that those rulers and authorities, those are spiritual hierarchies, demonic powers, angelic powers, depending on the context. And many Bible scholars believe, and I agree, that right here, what's happening is God wants to make known his manifold wisdom to the angels who don't even fully understand what it means to be loved and saved as we are. Because Christ died for us, not for the angels. That his manifold wisdom would be made known. And that in him, in Jesus, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. And here's a question I have. How many of you go to God in prayer with freedom and confidence? Like, you freely just pray. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter who you're with, how you have to pray out loud to yourself, whatever. You go with freedom and how many go with confidence? We should be confident to approach God. We shouldn't be sheepish about it. Now, I know we go through growth. And there's many of you, some on this live stream, that when I first met you, when you first began with Hope and Passion Ministries, you were pretty quiet, uh, not very apt to pray. And, and I've seen you grow in freedom and confidence. Paul says it, he wants that to happen. We can approach God and Paul said, I don't want you to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you. These sufferings actually result in your glory. You may not realize this, but the book of Ephesians was written to the church in Ephesus while Paul was in prison. This is one of his prison epistles. So his followers are troubled because he's suffering and he's not being released. And Paul says, I'm praying, I'm kneeling before the Father because I don't want you to be discouraged about my sufferings. God's doing something through this. So for this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father. What reasons? That the church would display the manifold wisdom of God even to the angels. Of course to this world, but even to the angels. Does your life display God's power and wisdom and magnificence? to the angelic beings who are diligently watching us. That's, that's an incredible thought. And also, he's kneeling before the Father that believers would not be discouraged by suffering. Oh my goodness, many of you know, I went through a period of, of five long weeks of severe suffering recently. And we all go through times of suffering. Financial suffering, physical suffering, relational suffering. There's all kinds of stuff. But this is one of the reasons Paul is praying, that we would not be discouraged by our suffering. These are some big and deep reasons to pray. How many of you ever say, oh, I'm going to pray right now so that my life would display God's wisdom even to angelic beings? How many of you ever sat down and prayed, oh, I just want believers to not be discouraged by my suffering? Wow. So let's talk about this. How the Apostle Paul unpacks this and gives us a model for how to pray. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now, I've talked about this before in other sessions. It's not the most important thing, your posture of prayer. Although I often do like to kneel. I often do like to lay and pray just to show my reverence. It helps me, right? But we can pray from any position. Paul says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom... Every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And that's basically a big way of saying, look, we all come from God. Whatever families there are, whatever heads of families there are, that's all rooted in creator God. He is the ultimate. Everyone derives their existence, their ability to continue to exist from God Almighty. He's the head of everything. All right. Here's where we're getting to the crux of the matter. This is what I want to begin to convict you and me in our prayer lives. This is the kind of stuff we should be praying for. 
other than, Lord, heal my hangnail. You know, uh, I have a mouth, mouth ulcer right now. I guess I haven't even really prayed about that. But, you know, we, we so many times just go to God for the same old, same old. we got to get deeper. So here it goes. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, Paul says, this is what I'm praying about. And if we just focus on two things right now, I pray that out of God's riches, not our own strength, not what we have to gather, but I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen your, what does it say? Say it out loud if you're able to talk, inner being. I pray that God would strengthen your inner being. Now, I really want to focus on this term, inner being. It's two words here translated in the NIV. And I want you to know that in the Greek, the Greek behind this, the term is esoanthropos. Now, you might recognize anthropos as the root from which we get anthropology meaning humans, mankind, okay? So what this means is the inner man, the esoanthropos, the inner being, not the outer shell, not, you know, our hairstyle or what we're wearing or, or what the state of our physical existence. Paul says, I'm praying that you'd be strong in your inner man, the place where nobody else can see but God. Actually, the Bible says that we don't even properly discern our own hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Only God can really understand the cracks and crevices of our hearts. We don't even know ourselves. And so our deepest prayer, beyond all the physical, beyond all the uh financial, beyond all the relational, beyond all the circumstantial, our deepest prayer should be, God, I need strength in my inner man, the invisible part of me, the person within, esoanthropos. Everybody with me so far? This is huge. If you'd even begin waking up tomorrow, or going to bed tonight and say, I'm going to direct this prayer toward my inner being, what a change will happen. Another place that we find this is in Romans 7.22. Paul said, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. And, and you might remember the context here. This is a famous passage where Paul says, the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing. The things that I do want to do, I never end up doing. He says, there's a war happening within my body. There's a war between my inner being, which is my mind, and my flesh, the corrupted part of me. But Paul said he gets victory through Jesus Christ and he confirmed in his inner being, he delights in God's law. So if it's the inner man that connects to the Holy Spirit's power, if it's the inner man that delights in pleasing God and it's the outer man, it's the flesh that doesn't, then where do you need your power? You know, we all think, oh, God, make me strong, you know. But really, it's about the inner man. It's about the strength in your spirit to do what is right before the Lord and to say no to sin. It's the same esoanthropos, the inner being. We find this also in 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And that's an incredible commentary on just the whole process of aging and everything or sicknesses. You know, as we see the demise of the outer person, we can watch the inner person just growing and being renewed. And that's beautiful because even as we age, even as we slow down, even as we become weaker in our outer man, the inner man can get stronger and stronger. Who's excited by that? I mean, we look at people and we think, oh, when you're young, that's when you're strong. That's when you can accomplish things. Actually, the older we get, the longer we walk with Jesus, the more frail our flesh becomes, the more focused we are on the inner self and eternity. 
praise God, the esoanthropos. This is critically important. So when we see this phrase in our Bible, you might want to circle that because the 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 uh, crux of your prayer life should be strength in the esoanthropos, the person within, the inner being. We so often pray about outward circumstances. Wonderful, wonderful preacher, Bible commentate, Bible commentator of old older times, Andrew McLaren. This is a deep quote, but listen. He said, the difference between the different objects of prayer is not to be found in the rejection of all temporal and external requests, but in remembering that there are two sets of things to be prayed about. And over one set must ever be written, if it be thy will. And over the other set, it need not be written because we are sure that the granting of our wishes is his will. And I give a hearty amen to that. Listen, it's not that you can never pray about outward circumstances. It's not that you can never pray about physical, tangible things. But we should have two kinds of prayers that we pray. And one set of requests we always have to ask, if it be thy will. Lord, uh, you know, my car is getting older. I need reliable transportation. Would you provide me with a newer car, if it be thy will? Uh, we need to pray that in that case. Lord, you know, in my case, I've had these hives for so long. I'm wearing down. It's wearing thin. If it's your will, please heal me. If not, sustain me. There are times when we have to pray over a set of, of, of circumstances or a, a, a set of requests. We must say, if it be your will. But there's a whole other set of requests that you never have to say, if it be your will. Lord, whatever comes into my life today, let me react in such a way as I am drawn closer to Jesus Christ. If it be your will, no. It is his will. Amen? Lord, whatever you do in my body, whatever you do in my circumstances, I want to bring honor to you. I want to see souls saved through my life. We never have to say, if it be your will. And see, those prayers where you don't have to say, if it be thy will, are the most important prayers. You can pray in a line with scripture and you can know that you're praying the will of God. I think, and, 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 and God meets us there. God understands because Jesus is the God man, 100% human, 100% divine. And as he's headed toward the cross, his famous prayer, he looks at the father and he says, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Right? Okay. That's an, if it be thy will prayer. God said, no, Jesus said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus understands the hardship, but he also understands the victory. If God would have taken that cup from him, none of us would be saved. Jesus would not have any adopted brothers and sisters. It was worth it. Two different kinds of prayers to pray. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. So he may be strengthened in the esoanthropos, in the inner being, in the inner man or woman. But we need to be strengthened with power. This is another critical word to understand when you're praying. Praying for power. Strengthen the inner being with power. The Greek word behind this is spelled D-Y-N-A-M-I-S. It's pronounced dunamis. Growing up in the assemblies of God, I often heard the word dunamis because there was a great emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit. Dunamis. God strengthened me with power. This is the exact same word as is found in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So let's look at it. Exact same Greek word, dunamis. Paul's saying, I want to be strengthened with dunamis in my inner being. This word 
dunamis means, and, and, and see if you need any of this. If anybody needs any of this in their inner woman or their inner man, let me ask you a question. How many of you need moral power? How many of you need power for excellence of soul? Anybody? Anybody need some power to be who God wants you to be, to be more excellent in your soul? I'm putting both hands up. Amen? This word dunamis also has to do with power consisting in or resting upon armies, forces, and hosts. Oh my, we have the heavenly host behind us. We have all the angels of heaven serving us as God's people. That's the kind of power we want to count on. This dunamis power is power for actually performing miracles, supernatural things that happen. And, and it, when I go back to it being the same one used in Acts 1.8, I don't want to skip past that verse. Acts 1.8 says, you know, Jesus was going to ascend up to heaven. And as he is going to ascend up to heaven, he says to his disciples, I want you to wait here. Because you're going to wait here in the upper room for my spirit to come, the spirit that I promised. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's still happening today. God is still taking his disciples and expanding the gospel outward. But the word is dunamis. You shall receive dunamis when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is what Paul's praying. We need that excellence of soul. We need that power. The same word dunamis is found in Acts 4.33. Here, here's some wonderful scriptures to pray for yourself if you want the strengthened in the inner being. Remember this. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. How many of you have ever needed power? You didn't know what to say to somebody about Jesus. You were a little shy about talking about Jesus. You need some dunamis. That's the kind of thing to get down on your knees and pray for. Don't just pray about the circumstances of your day. Pray for dunamis power to share the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the same word in Acts 6, 8. Stephen, as he's being stoned, he was a man full of God's grace and power. Before they stoned him, he performed great wonders and signs among the people. How many of you want the power to perform signs and wonders among people? To see prayers answered? To speak words of wisdom into somebody's life by the Holy Spirit? That's what we're praying for. Colossians 1.11, same word. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So that you might have great endurance and patience. None of you out there need extra patience, right? We got all the patience we need. That's Listen, instead of praying about frivolous things, how about tomorrow uh, spending some time in prayer, asking the Lord to increase your patience and your endurance. That word endurance in the Bible, uh, it, it comes, it's, it's hypomone. And what it actually means is to bear up under the weight of something. Who out there needs to make it a matter of prayer that God would help you to bear up under the weight of the difficulty you're in? You're in some situation that you feel like you cannot even handle anymore. Amen? And God wants you to get down on your knees and pray for dunamis power to continue to bear up under that thing. I, you know, I, my struggle with my disease, it's an easy one for you to understand. 40 years with a life-threatening illness, moment-by-moment moment disease that I got to deal with. Believe me, I get down on my knees and I pray for dunamis to bear up under this burden that the Lord is using for his purposes and not releasing from me. If he's not releasing it, he'll give you the dunamis power. But here's my question. Are you praying for the dunamis power or only praying for the removal of the burden? Okay? That's what we're talking about this evening. 2 Thessalonians 1.11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. That our God may make you worthy of his calling. And that by his dunamis... He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. How many of you want to be good for God? 
How many of you want to be a witness for God? How many of you want to accomplish great things for the Lord by faith? Pray for it. Pray for the power, the dunamis power in your inner being. 2 Timothy 1.7 The spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us dunamis, gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Some of us are so timid. Some of us are so afraid. Some of us need more self-discipline. We need to be who God has called us to be. We have access to that, but we need to pray for it. We need to seek it. And oh, I love this one, 2 Peter 1, 3. It just wraps up so much. God's divine power, God's divine dunamis has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and goodness. You ever wake up in the morning and say, God, I need this or that. I, I need to get rid of this headache. I, I need uh, access to more things. I, I, how am I going to get through life? I'm, I need enough money to function. I need enough psychological peace to function. I need X, Y, Z. Well, the Bible says he's given us divine dunamis. For what purpose? Everything we need to live a godly life. There it is. He's going to provide it. Are you praying for it? Okay, back to Ephesians 3.16. Paul said, I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. I think we've covered that well. Through his spirit. Can I get an amen? Right? It's provided by Jesus Christ, by his blood, by his resurrection, by his life. And it comes to us through his spirit. Praise God. How many of you know that Jesus in the flesh is at the right hand of the father praying for us? And while he's there, his spirit is here on earth giving us the dunamis power we need. That's a beautiful thought. I mean, we got it covered at every end here. Through God's spirit. That's how we get the power. We need to have greater emphasis on the third person of the triune God. His name is the Holy Spirit. The pulpit commentary. I love this. It, he's going to use the word scat, which is an old word, okay? And basically, the word scat means uh, dung. I won't say it any more gruff than that. But it means dung, animal dung, droppings. So watch this. The inner man is the real seat of influence in a life. But with us, it's the droppings or the dung of spiritual feebleness. Most men may contrive to order their outward conduct suitably, but who has control of the inner man? Oh, I've been preaching so much on this lately. I had an off-the-cuff sermon uh, the Sunday before last that the Holy Spirit led. Before that, I preached on the leaves on the fig tree. You know, no fruit, but the leaves are out there. Most Christians try to fake their way. They try to look like outwardly they've got things together. They're doing the right thing. But inwardly, they're a disastrous, evil mess. Selfish, jealous, evil mess. Hiding so many sins from others. And it should be that our inner man is what we concentrate on. But for our society today, that's like the leftover, the, the droppings of feebleness. It should be totally the opposite. We should be praying and focusing on the building up of our inner being through the Spirit of God with His dunamis power. Hallelujah. Faith, trust, humility, love, patience, and the like graces which belong to the inner man are what we are weakest in. What we have least power to make strong. Hey, you can sometimes muster up enough, enough outer strength or enough pride to try to pretend like you're something that you're not. But God sees the core of you. God knows who you really are. How many of you out there want to pray when you get down on your knees and confess to God, I need fixed where I really am in the inner being. 
And God is gracious to do that. He is so gracious to do that. In this very region, it is sought that the it is sought that the Ephesians might be strengthened with might by the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is available for this very purpose for all that ask Him. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ as the forgiver of your sins, the savior of your soul, the remaker of your spirit, then you've got the Holy Spirit. He comes to live in you. He will give you the power for all this. Now, Paul says this comes out of his glorious riches. It doesn't come by my strength. You're not going to muster this up on your own. You're not going to pull this from your own resources. This comes from God. All right, let's move on to the uh, the last part of this session. Paul says, why am I praying for all this strengthening in the inner man? Here's why. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, that's a weird thing to pray for, for people who are already Christians. I mean, isn't the very definition of a Christian that Christ dwells in my heart through faith? Let's think about this a little bit more deeply. That he really dwells in your heart. That he really lives there. I love what uh, the old commentator Matthew Poole said. That Christ may intimately and continually possess and fill. Not your heads only with his doctrine. But your very affections with his spirit. Think about that. Paul says, I want Christ to really dwell in your hearts. I want him to continually, constantly be filling, not just your, your head. You know, so many people claim Christianity because they say, oh, well, I believe in this certain, you know, this doctrine. I believe that Bible verse. Here's the core doctrine of our church and my mind. But this isn't about your mind. This isn't about you giving mental assent to something. This is about Christ actually living in the deepest place of your being and your continual awareness that he's there. When you're weak, that he's there. When you're strong, that he's there. When everything makes sense, that he's there. When you're confused, he's there. That's what this is about. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power, there it is again, dunamis, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I pray that you may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Paul is always praying for power, dunamis power. He's praying for that power to enter the inner man, the eso anthropos. And now he's praying that all of God's people would have the power to grasp something. When's the last time you prayed that you would be able to actually grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? I honestly believe that some of you watching this will be set free just by this very concept itself because you've never really been able to grasp God's love for you. There are people who have been Christian years and years and years, and, and I've been one of them, and, and yet we have gotten to a place where we had never truly understood God's love for us. That's something to pray about. How about tomorrow instead of praying about just your sore foot and your, your aunt's job interview and, and all these other things. Not that those aren't important, but how about praying that you would be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now, Paul was praying this for Christians. So there must be something deep to this. And the first thing I want you to notice, and I'm going to bring mathematics into this. You know, I was a math teacher for quite a while. I love mathematics, and I want to show you that God is Lord over math, and he shows a lot of things through math. This is incredible. Paul actually said, I want you to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
How many dimensions are mentioned there? One, two, three, four. Now, normally, I'm going to hearken you back to Algebra 1, geometry. Who's excited to go there? Oh, let's just go back to some upper middle school, beginning of high school math, right? Talking about volume. Now, just to refresh your memory, volume, for example, with this cube here, if this were an actual cube in front of us, volume would mean how many square inches of sand does it take to fill this thing? How much can this thing contain? In other words, what is the guts of that cube? How much of something can that cube hold? That's what volume is. And if you go back to your math classes, you'll remember that we find the contents of what, for example, a cube can hold by multiplying, when it's a rectangular prism such as this, we multiply three things. Can anybody say it with me as I put it up on the screen? Length times width times height. How many of you remember that from math, right? That's how you find the guts, the amount of contents that uh, a cube can hold. You'd multiply length times width times height. There are three dimensions. And this is what, you know, engineers use when we're building things, when we're desi designing things. This is a mathematical truth. It's length times width times height to find the contents of this cube. So if, because it's a cube in this case, each piece were 10 inches, 10 inches long, 10 inches wide, 10 inches high, then if we do the mathematics, what we need to do is multiply those three things together. Length times width times height. 10 times 10 times 10 gives us 1,000. And of course, these would be cubic inches or inches cubed because we're talking about three dimensions, right? That's how you find out how much this cube can contain. How much sand, how much water can we actually put in there? Well, the reason I love to bring this up is Paul is doing something miraculous and talking about our hearts being able to hold a fourth dimension of God's love. Can I get an amen? Not just length and width and height, but he speaks of a depth. He speaks about the contents of God's love going beyond our understanding of what we think we can contain. The volume of God's love, my friends, has a depth. Paul said it's not just long, it's not just wide, it's not just high, it's not just within the three dimensions that we know. It has a fourth dimension. It has a depth. And I want to say to you this evening, I pray that the Holy Spirit is showing you and will continue to show you that you can enter by the power of the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has done, the dunamis power of God to know the fourth dimension of God's love. This isn't an episode of Star Trek. I'm talking serious stuff. We can enter the fourth dimension of God's amazing love. Shelly, what are you talking about that? What are you talking about? I'm talking about a dimension, an aspect to the love of God that goes beyond our ability to comprehend. Exactly what Paul was getting at. He said, I'm praying that you have the dunamis, the power to grasp this concept. Listen, how long is God's love? Long enough to have loved you and planned to die for you from eternity past, knowing all you would do. Oh, somebody watching needs strengthen in their inner being right now because you cannot believe or grasp. You've never been able to accept the fact that Jesus agreed to die on the cross for your sins from eternity past. 
He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And even though from eternity past, not just thousands of years ago or millions of years ago, of timeless, from eternity past, Jesus decided. He looked down through the annals of time. He knew who you would be. He knew what you would do. He knew how you would fail him. He knew how you would rebel. And still he said, I'm going to the cross for you. That's how long his love is. And it continues on into eternity future. Maybe you need to get down on your knees tonight and pray that you would be able to grasp how long is the love of Christ. How wide? Wide enough to reach the ends of the earth and to the farthest extreme of any circumstance. You say, Shelly, I'm, I'm the extreme situation. My family, my son, my daughter, my loved one, they're the extreme of sinfulness, the extreme of rebellion, the extreme of drug down into circumstances. They can't ever be torn from that, from that atheistic outlook, from that forlorn attitude. Really? Because Paul said, I want you to pray that you could grasp how wide is God's love, how far it reaches to the extremes. I feel his Holy Spirit moving and working. How high? How high is God's love? Some of you need to know that his love is high enough to take you from the lowest place on earth to the very throne of God. Some of you need to know that his love is strong enough, that his blood paid the price so that no matter how low you have sunk in sin, in sadness, in despair, in doubt, no matter how low, his love can take you straight to the throne of God, right to heaven. And how deep is God's love? It's that fourth dimension. Deep enough that there's not a sin from which God cannot rescue you. Oh, some of us are not serving the Lord as we should because there's a sin that we just feel we can't get past. Quit praying about so many circumstantial external things and devote some serious prayer time to understanding that God's love for you that, that the Holy Spirit would show you dunamis power to know that God's love can rescue you from any sin, from any addiction. It's deep enough. There's not a place you can find yourself that God does not say, I will go there with you. I love that. You go somewhere you think is hopeless. You go somewhere you think you're all alone. You go somewhere you think... This is the end. I, I, I can't do it anymore. This is the most horrible thing I could have imagined. And guess what? God's love is so deep. He goes there with you. Psalm 139 tells us if I go to the farthest part of the sea, sink into the depths of the sea, he is still there. Boy, that's something to pray about, isn't it? And to bring this home to an even greater degree, it's incredible what Paul says next. He's already asked God to help us grasp a, a dimension we don't even know. And now he says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You know, in case you didn't believe me about the mathematics of the volume stuff, let's just seal it up with what Paul summarizes here. He says, and I want you to pray that you could know something that surpasses knowing. Okay, this, if this isn't the grandest, most beautiful oxymoron you have ever heard in your life, let it be now, right? Paul says, I want you to get down on your knees and I want you to pray that you could know something that you can't know. I want you to pray that you could know something that goes above your ability to know it. And that's why so many of you are stuck. 
because you're, 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 you've created God in your own image rather than realizing that he has created us in his image. You've, you've shrunken down your understanding of God because you've not been in his word the way you should, you've not been taught the word the way you should. He's opening it up now by the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got to have a big vision of God. God is actually able to make us know something that our regular knowledge could not know. And that's because it's by his dunamis power, the power of his spirit. I want you to know something that your brain can't really figure out. And I put in my notes, huh? <laughs> yeah. Pray that. Pray that tomorrow. God, help me to know what I can't really know. Help me to know something that's bigger than my brain. And it's kind of like, you know, uh, when Paul says in Philippians, he, he says, we can get a peace that passes what? Transcends understanding. Doesn't make sense rationally, but I still have peace. That's what we're getting at here. It's that fourth dimension. It's knowing and experiencing and being filled with Christ's love even when the circumstances don't make sense. It's knowing something that is greater than you trying to mentally connect dots. God's bigger than your dots. Amen? To know something that surpasses knowledge. Why? So that you may be filled to the measure of of all the fullness of God. When's the last time you prayed and said, God, fill me to the measure with all of your fullness? It's kind of almost a scary prayer to pray. Because the fullness of God there means the whole sum and aggregate of all the energies, powers, and attributes of the divine nature. The total Godhead in its plenitude and abundance. Pray that all of God would be in me to the measure not just half full not just three quarter full not just almost to the rim but that would be filled completely with god andrew mclaren again speaking of this he said people will say does such a prayer as this upon man's lips not forget the limits that bound the creature's capacity can the finite contain the infinite I mean, I'm a finite being. He's infinite. How can the finite contain the infinite? Well, that is a verbal puzzle. And I answer yes. The infinite can come into the finite. The finite can contain the infinite. If you are talking about two hearts that love, one of them God's and one of them mine. We have got to keep very clear and distinct before our minds the broad, firm line of demarcation between the creature and the creator. Now let me pause there real quick because I did mention this in the video I made today about the transgender thing. I had uh, you know, heard someone speaking in support of transgenderism and he was talking about the fluidity of reality and not just the fluidity of gender, but that is based in the fact that uh, everything is fluid. You know, humans are 70% water. We truly are made of the elements of the earth. So we are the same as the earth. And actually the world is the same as God. And what, what that is, is that's pantheism. That's heresy. That's pantheism. We are theists. We believe in God as transcendent above his creation, outside of his creation, and yet choosing to be a part of it. But pantheism says that all is God and God is everything. Andrew McLaren is saying we can believe that the infinite enters the finite when we keep that clear line of demarcation between the creature and the creator, or else you get into a pantheistic region where both creature and creator expire. Because if God is everything and everything is God, then nothing is of any different essence. You don't really have a creature and a creator anymore. And that is heresy. That is false belief. But if we know that there is a God who transcends, who is infinitely above me, a God that does not depend on me, a God that created everything by nothing but his own word, if we know that to be true, 
As long as we retain clearly in our minds the consciousness of the personal distinction between God and his child. So as that the child can turn around and say, I love thee. And God can look down and say, I bless thee then all identification and mutual indwelling and impartation from him of himself are possible and are held forth as the aim and end of Christian life. Think about that for a minute. All the petty things that we pray for, all the things that we pray for that are under the category, if it be thy will, And yet, we should be praying, God, give me the dunamis power of your spirit, provided by the life and sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the unseen inner part of me. Bring that power in every crack and crevice that I don't even know, that I can't conceive. Bring that fourth dimension love and power into me so that I could be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God so that I can be as glorifying to you, God, as possible. Bring as many people to the kingdom through my life as I possibly can. Let me lift you up in every minute of my living with every fiber of my being. Isn't that the prayer that we can pray where we know we never have to say, if it be thy will. Hallelujah. And then he closes, not a him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. There's that word again, immeasurably, fourth dimension, beyond what we can understand. God is able to do immeasurably, not only more than what we ask, but even imagine. Whatever you've even imagined that you could do for God, God can do more than that. Amen? Pray about that. Say, God, here's what I've imagined. Here's what I've envisioned that I'd love to do for you. And God can do even more. Wow. To him. And this is what we close with. Watch this. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Look at this. To God, this, this blew my mind when I realized this the other day. To God be the glory. Of course I understand that God's glory is in Christ Jesus. Jesus always glorified the Father. To, to God be the glory in Christ Jesus, but also what? In the church. And the church is not a building. The church is the collection of all individual people who have trusted Jesus as Savior and living relationship with God. God's glory can be in me as it was in Christ Jesus. How beautiful is that? What a privilege and what a miracle that we can bring glory to God as Jesus does. And this will go on throughout all generations forever and ever. It'll go on as long as the earth endures. And after this world is over forever and ever into the new world. My friends, I pray, I hope that your world has been rocked, that your prayer life has been changed through the power of God's spirit. We love you. Let me just say, God in Jesus name, fulfill all of your word that we've talked about in the lives of each one who has listened. Let each one call upon Jesus as Savior and be filled with the power, the dunamis of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.